So um, now uh, we have uh, two other colleagues from uh, REACH um, who will be presenting on supporting the CCCM cluster data collection and remote testing. Um, the presenters will be Arthur and Matt. Um, guys, are you there? Yep, uh, I'm here. James, uh, Matt, are you here? I'm here. Perfect. Okay, I let think me, the uh, previous colleague, colleagues have to stop sharing their screen. Right, this is not your slide, James, right? No, that's correct. So, uh, perfect. So now you can share your. Okay. All right, so just a, a quick introduction from my side. Um, James MacArthur, I'm a GIS and, and settlement specialist uh, supporting REACH's global programs. Uh, specifically supporting the CCCM cluster uh, across our, our country missions uh, who are working on uh, with CCCM. I'm also joined today with uh, by uh, Matthew Wenzel, uh, who oversees our uh, GIS and our global GIS and remote sensing uh, programs and initiatives uh, from Geneva. Uh, so, just uh, what, we're, what we're gonna talk about today, which for some of you um, may not be, be too new, perhaps in terms of the activities as REACH has been supporting for, uh, for quite a few years now uh, with this to CCCM and specifically on uh, field data collection and remote sensing as our colleagues, uh, Joseph already started to, to share some experiences. Uh, but what has, uh, but there has been a few key developments uh, in the last year, uh, I think that are, are worth uh, sharing, uh, specifically around, uh, let's say the the better harnessing of the three partner organizations that make up the REACH initiative, uh, to ensure that the field data collection initiatives um, are, are complemented uh, by the remote sensing in initiatives, and vice versa and how we can better bring in uh, this remote sensing initiative to support our field data collections and help fill some important information gaps uh, to our CCM colleagues and uh, the response. So uh, as, our, as, our, as, as, you, as many of you already know, and as our previous colleagues uh, quickly uh, presented, uh, but for those of you who are not so familiar or it's just confusing in general, uh, it can be confusing for many people exactly uh, what this initiative is and, and who we are. But the REACH initiative is essentially three, uh, three organizations. You have ACTED, um, uh, Operational NGO, you have IMPACT Initiatives, who supports with the, the, the programming and uh, assessment analysis and information products. And you have uh, UNITAR, UNISAT, so the United Nations Space-Based uh, Application Program. And together we, we form uh, the REACH initiative uh, and, and work on activities jointly together. Now, some of the, some of the key activities that we, we support CCCM are, you may be familiar with is, uh, is uh, is uh, something that really needs to be, that really is complemented both by our, our field teams and, and data collection uh, on the ground, but also uh, supported with remote sensing activities and how these two can actually complement each other uh, throughout various activities. Uh, for example, uh, I'll go through four activities uh, today in this presentation. The first is uh, supporting with site identification. Uh, so we have, uh, we usually have an extensive network of, of field teams, uh, enumerators uh, that can help provide insight into uh, the unfolding situation and locations of spontaneous self-settled sites. Um, now, coupled with remote sensing supports, we are able to help identify uh, and verify these site locations. 
uh, that are, are developing, as well as allow for some population estimations uh, through shelter counts and, and triangulation through different sources to provide some more clarity and insight uh, to the situation. Um, and triangulate those sources, whether they're coming from local registration lists or key informants uh, to provide some, some clarity on this. The second uh, activity is, is something also I'd say is quite new to the last year, uh, is providing more support to hazard exposure analysis. Uh, as we have a better picture of, of where all these uh, specifically both camps, but also the, the self-settled sites are, um, we're starting to conduct and utilize more of our remote sensing capacities between IMPACT and UNICEF to conduct hazard analysis. And this allows us to help identify some potential uh, sites and shelters that could be exposed. Um, then we have our, our site profiling. And, and now that we have a better, uh, perhaps, understanding of, uh, of where uh, all these self-settled sites are, so I'm not talking maybe specifically about uh, the formal camps right now, uh, but once we have a better understanding of where uh, these self-settled sites are and, and the, the identification and verification of these sites, it allows us to ensure that they are included in uh, our profiling for when we do uh, multi-sectoral needs assessments uh, in these sites. Um, obviously, uh, if we don't have uh, clarity on their on their exact locations or or typologies, it's it's all it's hard to ensure their inclusion during such uh, initiatives um, for profiling. And usually this is a, a large scale, but I'll, I'll go in a bit further. And then we have camp profiling, which is maybe more of our historic uh, product, information product, uh, where we were supporting with household interviews, uh, multi-sectoral needs uh, of the camp population, but also providing that camp mapping in terms of uh, collecting data on uh, infrastructure and service mapping uh, in, in, in these uh, large camp or camp-like settings. And each of these activities really are interlinked between the field data collection and also remote sensing activities. And, and, and each uh, help lead into the other uh, from the start first phase um, of the response early in the cycle of, of just identifying sites uh, to, to the end result of being able to do a detailed needs assessment uh, of those populations after the sites have been identified. Just give a few few examples now from different CCCM country missions uh, where we've been doing different some of these different activities. So in terms of site identification, essentially how it's working now and we're, we're getting better at it is uh, you can see here in this this uh, top diagram, uh, you know, how the REACH initiative uh, works in practice uh, between the different partners. So uh, you have uh, uh, our, our active field teams uh, providing uh, insight uh, about potential uh, site locations, whether that's their mobile CCCM, uh, key informant interviews. Um, uh, they, they, they pass this information on to, to impact uh, or, or REACH colleagues. And uh, they're processing this information, they're following up, they're verifying, they're documenting this information into uh, to a long list uh, of potential sites uh, that could be identifiable, specifically more, more so the, the self-settled open air uh, sites um, in, in tents and makeshift shelters. We then pass this information on to our UNISAT colleagues uh, who then are able to, to help uh, uh, verify or pinpoint those locations um, and pass this information uh, back to us um, in terms of helping us uh, identify these, these self-settled sites. Uh, then once uh, you know, the, this REACH initiative, basically the three organizations is, is finished uh, through this process of, of going back and forth, we then share this information uh, onwards to our, our CCCM colleagues and allow them to actually do the, the uh, site verification and validation uh, process um, uh, and, and share this information onwards to them where they can actually then go uh, through their field teams 
and and verify uh, such data. So that's one example. That's an example of how that process works. And you can see a real example here through a hard to reach area in a free district in northwest Syria, uh, where you have perhaps limited capabilities of of, uh, of doing um, direct data collection or site visits, but. Uh, through some knowledgeable key informants, uh, through satellite information, we were able to, you know, identify specific self-settled uh, sites um, and share this information to the CCM cluster. Now, a lot of this, and depending on the country context, a lot of this is quite sensitive information, and it's usually shared just bilaterally with uh, our CCM colleagues. This is not something that you would maybe find on the Reach Resource Center or Relief Web because this is uh, sometimes seen as quite sensitive, very specific locational information of displaced people. Now, whether it's hosted on uh, on a UN server like a UNITAR UNISAT server or shared uh, bilaterally to our CCM colleagues, that's usually how this information product gets out there. And we're doing this in a few a few uh, country mission responses, but we're not doing it everywhere that we could be doing it. And this is something that we'd like to advocate to continue to support on and make uh, our colleagues aware of as, a, as an option that exists. Um, now, uh, just another example, also from a larger scale, it's a bit harder, a bit more time uh, 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 resource heavy, but we can do things at a, at a much larger geographical scale, looking at entire districts um, where we're, we're, we're instead of being provided a very specific locational information, perhaps from, from field colleagues, but actually looking ourselves uh, and combing through recent satellite imagery. So the ability to actually move satellites to collect uh, images from specific uh, areas of interest to the CCCM cluster uh, on a wider scale and then comb through the data uh, at a finer level to try to even identify these, these uh, spontaneous settlements, self-settlement sites. Uh, which is an example here in Merit Tamzreen, also in Idlib in northwest Syria, where we also did this uh, in support to, to Ocha and the CCM cluster there. And we were able to get uh, some, a good picture in terms of the number who are in uh, shelters and who are uh, in tents or makeshift shelters. And, and through you know, good information on the number of people per shelter, we can start to calculate potential numbers of IDPs, which is also very useful for some of the OCHA MSNA work we do in terms of sampling populations. I'll, I'll go with that maybe a, a bit later. And then another new advancement in the last year, as this is a, a, a time, uh, this is a resource heavy initiative of combing through uh, finding uh, spontaneous self settled sites uh, is the advancements in AI, so artificial intelligence. And, and one partner we've been working with is Pictera. And you can see an example here uh, as well uh, as well as is how that is working. But uh, I think perhaps my colleague uh, Matt can speak a bit more on this as some of our specific AI and remote sensing initiatives over the last year. Sure. So historically, um all of the remote sensing analysis that we've done for, for sites and, and shelters has, has been manual. And normally this isn't so tedious uh, at the individual site level, but in, particularly in Northwest Syria, when we're looking at wide territory, um, we, can, we can do very good, detailed, accurate analysis of these territories, but it takes so long that by the time we get to an output, it's outdated and we've seen a lot of rapid shifts recently um, that have pushed us to come up with ways to do the analysis much faster. And over the past couple of years, we tried different AI approaches uh, through our partnership with UNISAT and they always came up wanting, um, but Bigterra, which is a Swiss company, uh, has been making relatively decent strides uh, with their application. And we've been using that quite extensively with uh, with very good results. So we're able to analyze very large areas, I'd say full sub-districts at a time, and with minimal quality assurance, quality uh, checks, we can process the data in maybe 10% of the time that we would that we would normally allocate for manual analysis. 
So this is allowing us to keep up with the pace of change um, in more near real time, let's say. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Matt. Um, so yeah, I think something that uh, could definitely be uh, uh, extremely useful uh, as we started to pilot this in the last year in, in some uh, locations and something that becomes uh, more feasible to cut down time for uh, future responses. Um, now, how this all feeds into another interesting uh, component that I said we've also been touching on in the last year is now that we have uh, now that we're starting to have a very good sense of the of documenting um, uh, specifically with geospatial data of all these uh, camps, but also self-settled sites, um, as well as doing shelter counts through the AI, where we have specific number of shelters digitized. Um, this is a lot of uh, useful information uh, that we have. And now when we start looking at uh, hazard exposure analysis, because this is obviously a, a pressing issue with, with, uh, with climate change and, and the frequency and intensity um, of, these, of these hazards, uh, and especially the dis displaced population is a specifically uh, uh, more vulnerable group of people and usually more likely uh, exposed to such hazards. It's really putting them at, at more risk. Um, so I think this is also a, a big initiative uh, that we've been working on the last year. We've, we've piloted this in the Central African Republic and uh, also in, in uh, Northwest Syria uh, as two CCM responses where we've looked at the flood susceptibility of, of the larger area, where we're looking at using remote sensing tools to, to take into consideration um, uh, you know, the terrain, the land cover, precipitation data for modeling, and we're able to identify um, flood susceptible areas. Then with very specific data uh, for camps, but also a long list of, of informal sites is, uh, is being able to overlay this information and start to identify potential sites and even down to the shelter level that could be uh, exposed to uh, a flood hazard in, in this specific example. But we can look at replacing X hazard with landslide, mudslide, etc. Uh, you can see here in the example, this is from, from CAR, uh, where we did the flood susceptibility uh, analysis, but also are working with uh, the site mapping uh, in terms of delineating those boundaries and, and, and documenting and digitizing those shelters. Uh, and we can start, uh, you know, uh, informing the response about uh, those different levels of exposure to take into consideration. Another example of this is in, 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 in Dana and in Syria. Uh, specifically here, we're looking at the Dana catchment area, uh, which is obviously uh, the home to, to the majority of displaced uh, people in Northwest Syria. And there's uh, uh, hundreds, uh, if not a thousand uh, camps and informal sites in this area with very large clusters. And here uh, we're looking at hydraulic modeling. So really looking at the uh, using precipitation uh, events. So we took models from 2018 and 2019 from real events um, in the nearby area, looking at a six hour storm event with a peak rainfall intensity of 143 millimeters an hour, um, which has happened in the past in this area as a real, uh, a real scenario. And what would that calculate in terms of a storm, a storm, a storm water flow um, in terms of a flash flooding event in this area? And uh, we ran this analysis and we can see how this overlays with the different clusters and, and the number of which clusters uh, would be most exposed and even which clusters in terms of the number of shelters that could be exposed. We identified, um, uh, we identified uh, around 4,800 uh, shelters exposed to flash flooding um, and 2,259 uh, specifically to a flood hazard uh, of, of medium hazard or higher specifically. Um, which just to put out there, there's, there's a uh, math, I don't know if you can quote me, I think there's around 120,000 shelters. There's, there's a lot there uh, in this specific area. 
Uh, and you can see here in some specific examples of, of the, the granular detail that we're able to, to, to provide uh, to, to the response. So you can see here an example of zoom in from Atma in 2015. Uh, you have these, uh, oops, you have these uh, sites where where, I, where the, the terrain and the flash flooding, which, which really uh, happens every winter in the rainy season, um, you know, some of this area is, is quite known to the population, uh, but as people settle and as things expand, um, uh, and, 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 and the, those, those displaced populations, uh, maybe he's not really taking this into uh, as the primary concern, but you can see how, how eventually as settlements uh, grow into new areas, they can start to settle into areas that have been uh, historically known and are known to, to uh, be more susceptible to flash flooding. And we're able to identify those specific areas and, and shelters. I think this is um, something that's interesting to take into consideration, um, both from the very onset of a crisis um, in terms of uh, of site uh, identification and locations, but even uh, afterwards in terms of talking about preparation and mitigation efforts in advance of rainy season, winterization, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so this is something we've, we've, we've now done in uh, two or three uh, country missions and something that we think is very interesting uh, to, to move forward with and work in partnership with, with uh, the remote sensing efforts of impact and, and, and UNISAT and um, our colleagues acted who are involved a lot in, in, in camp management as well and, and the CCM cluster. Okay, uh, a few minutes here, but I'll uh, move on to site profiling. So, like I said, the ability of knowing specifically where all the informal self-settled sites are allows us to include them into site profiling exercises. So it's very important, this linkage of, uh, of identifying and, and verifying these sites so that they can be included in such field work and assessments that uh, our ACT and REACH colleagues carry out. Um, and the interesting th thing here about these, these site profiling initiatives that we would do in Iraq and in Yemen and um, uh, Somalia, uh, et cetera, is that uh, sometimes in the, big, the biggest uh, you know, data collection uh, in terms of the HNO, HRP and uh, the MSNA is that usually actually you won't find a disaggregation. You may find a disaggregation of, of IDP uh, versus host community, you may find a disaggregation of IDP in camp, but most likely you won't find a disaggregation about the needs of IDP specifically in sites, um, whether that's collective centers or self-settled sites, etc. So sometimes really uh, this, this subpopulation group is, is a bit missing in, in the overall uh, picture. Um, and I think that these, that these targeted assessments specifically to this subpopulation group are very informative uh, for their situation and needs. And I think we can do a better job of feeding that into the HNO HRP process um, as we, we do this uh, for informal sites specifically. And then lastly, the camp profiling, like I said, this is something that we've done quite historically um, and that we continue to do. It's, it's a more detailed analysis. We're talking about household interviews that are you know, statistically representative of the, of the population and really trying to benchmark uh, the, you know, the minimum standards, um, you know, sphere standards, et cetera, uh, in terms of are we meeting those targets? And usually we try to do these uh, different frequency intervals, whether that's annually, biannually, quarterly, and we can start to actually compare uh, previous rounds to current rounds and see that actual change in those uh, sectoral standards um, to, to do some trends analysis to see if there is improvement uh, in the situation. And then the other component specifically from the remote sensing side is again helping with the infrastructure mapping um, of services so we can better understand where wash infrastructure is, where water access points are, where latrines are, uh, how, where the health facilities are, where are registration areas, um, food distribution points, uh, 
And a lot of this also fits into some interesting gap analysis, geospatial analysis. There's a lot of standards that are based on, you know, how far is that water access point? How close is that latrine to this shelter? Fire breaks uh, are, are, are camps that are, you know, informal or self-settled camps uh, being, uh, you know, designed or implemented without respecting the, the, the needed fire breaks uh, between shelters or between sectors. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that we can also help with from the remote sensing and GIS perspectives of helping confirm um, or, or investigate such, of the, such standards that we can assist with. Uh, so I think uh, that is uh, it from, from us. And I know some of this is not necessarily new to some of you for our colleagues uh, today, but I just wanted to share perhaps some insight into some some maybe interesting advancements uh, that we're investigating on, on helping inform certain uh, information uh, gaps or uh, that could be of interest to, to the CCCM cluster partners and, and the wider response. Uh, uh, thank you for everyone's time. And it uh, looks like we have about maybe a few minutes for questions, if there are any. James, I'm reading uh, Brian's question about the has flood risk modeling been over wide geographic areas or have you done it at the site level in any areas? If at the site level, how were you able to get digital elevation models with high enough resolution to be useful? Um, so, yep. Um, so in the example in uh, the, the Dana catchment area, so this is quite a large catchment area, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, all the, the big clusters from Ka to Derhas and Atma, um, so it is a fairly large geographical area, not all of Northwest Syria or not all of Idlib, but it's still a large uh, geographical area. And the digital uh, elevation model or, uh, or, or terrain model we, we uh, got from UNISAT was uh, two and a half meters. Um, so uh, decent, uh, we think a decent uh, high resolution at two and a half meters and using a real storm uh, storm uh, events uh, from from the area we think it's a, it's a, a fairly accurate model we also then uh, shared this and in triangulated with our ccm colleagues uh, in gaziantep to historical sites that have reported issues with flooding through 2019 2018 um, and you can actually uh, verify that these sites have been experiencing it in, in, in the past. And hopefully this can help uh, maybe pinpoint some more of those specific locations within the larger clusters uh, and camps. Just let me add one thing to that. Um, the high res elevation models are expensive, uh, sometimes prohibitively so. So in this case, we, we looked at one catchment area, which we could afford to purchase. And we're hoping to advocate for better funding to, to proceed with this kind of analysis elsewhere. Um, the flood susceptibility analysis that we showed earlier relies on lower resolution, freely available data, which is good for uh, wider geographic areas, regional analysis, but it's not enough, um, en not enough detail for site level. So we have to link this element in to be able to speak with uh, relative certainty about areas that are at risk, at least at the shelter level. Okay. Well, uh, if no other no other questions, uh, still have another minute or two. If there's anything else, one more from Brian just came in. What has been your experience with helping field staff to understand what both the capabilities and limitations that geospatial analysis can bring? Uh, so I guess the, the limitations is obviously we're talking about speed, um, depending on, on, on the response, uh, the crisis response, the need for information, uh, the ability to triangulate uh, numbers, verify locations. Uh, you know, we work as fast as we can, but we also have, you know, we have to take in the financial limitations, um, UNISAT's capacity, whether there's available satellite imagery, whether we need to task satellite imagery to capture images, talking about manual label or, or artificial intelligence. So really that time of getting this information back to the field uh, in, a, in a sufficient time that's still useful for, for operations and planning from a, an emergency perspective. Um, 
what I what I'd say is 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 some of the limitations that have always existed, but we've been continually trying to work on improving. Whether that's you know improving our, our hiring and capacity to do some of the analysis tasks ourselves as as impact and reach, um, uh, or or looking into investments with like Pictera, as Matt has has shown as as an example, so that we can help uh, alleviate some of those those uh, limitations or concerns uh, from the field staff. Um, and then in terms of, um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just leave it there, but uh, yeah, there's obviously, I think it's, it's, it's been welcomed from a lot of our, our cluster and, and working group partners, this information, and uh, it's really always just about time and how we can do things faster and, and, and share it while it's still extremely relevant. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, James and, and Matt. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, so before we move uh, to the next uh, presentation, just to uh, highlight that Joseph has put some um, resources on the chat. So uh, please take a look.